So when I throw like taller, thinner objects or anything that's super thin, I prefer to work with really stiff clay. Um, when I throw plates and bigger things, I prefer to work with softer clay because I have, it hurts, it hurts. I have tennis elbow in both my elbows from ceramics. Um, and it's painful. The shoulders are bad. So your shoulders are bad. What clay do you use? I use a red clay now, but I'm actually doing a porcelain workshop this summer. Uh -huh. and once I get through the red clay, I'm not going to switch it for the color vibrancy, actually. So yeah, like, that's. I'm not committed to any one clay. Yeah. The, so, at Armadillo, if you're getting Armadillo clay, they yeah, did come up with a newer porcelain that they claim is just like Coleman. I've not tried it um, because I buy, I mean, I get a ton of clay at a time to go to my house. So, yeah. So does it stay soft to the end of that 2,000 pounds? Well, so we divvy it up. I end up with between uh, six or 700 pounds like every six months, I'd say. Um, I go through 1,000 pounds of clay a year myself. Um, and it, it, it definitely like like I keep it boxed up. I don't I don't unbox it, and I think that's one key to keeping it wetter. But I mean I have clay that's been sitting in my studio for four years, and that's like tumbler clay. Okay. It is stiffer, right. um, but that's also one of the benefits of ordering it on the wetter side. Right. Yeah, and that 2.2 is a little bit softer. It's not. Super soft, and you're, you're more than welcome to feel this. And it is thixotropic, so it's going to act like it's really stiff right now, but it's really kind of soft and wiggly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so it gives me that that freedom of when I'm getting closer to the end of like, say, keep that whole 700 pounds, and I get through, because I also I do sell it to some of my students, right? Because nobody distributes right. this play there. Um, but uh, yeah, so if I get towards that, like towards the end and it's starting to get stiffer, I'll hang on to like 200 pounds, do another order, save that 200 strictly for like tall thin items. And then I have softer stuff for like bigger things that my body needs. So when you first get your order, you throw in those softer pieces. I always have a stash of the stiffer stuff. Plus I have a
sabbatical replacement that you were teaching there for a little bit. Where? Which? Uh, UT Austin. You were oh, teaching for I, like a semester. I was, I, what I did is, uh, it was right after they put their play program, right. and I got brought in to work with the K through, to, to work with art education because they didn't have a play component with the K through 12 for, for, you know, for, for art ed. Oh, okay. So it was two weeks that I worked there. Oh. Wow. So, yeah. I know, I wish I would have been there longer, uh -huh. but uh, they didn't have any equipment anymore. Right. <laughs> it was done in over one. But I teach at the Contemporary Museum. Okay. So, yeah. That works. Do y'all in ceramics know that what I've just done here just kind of lit? Yeah. A very famous person does that. Well, people. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, a long time ago, I was doing this workshop with my buddy Ron Myers, who is one of our most important ceramic yeah. people in the world, and a dear friend of mine for 52 years. I never did that lift, but I mean, you see it with with uh, Ken Ferguson. Uh, I mean, all the contemporaries of Pete. Yeah, everybody did. I didn't want to do it because it was Pete, and Pete was a good friend of mine for 30 years. So doing this thing with Ron, and he did that lift, and I said, "Boy, I really, I, it's the perfect solution for how I work. I want to do it, but I hate to do it because it's Pete did all the time, and then everybody copies it. Yeah. Not that I'm going to be copying. <laughs> and he, so I said to, to talk to Pete about it. It's from the Roman time, that edge. So I think about five years ago, I started doing it. But it looks like it. I mean, it looks like it. Yeah. 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 I said, well, I might get too. No, I do it. I mean, it's the perfect solution. Well, no, I, this clay is really, remember I talked about my clay body has the tooth to it? I mean, this is, I, the two plates I did the other day, I kind of touched the rim like that and it just split. So I mean, this may have flop, it may not, I don't know, but this kind of plate just doesn't take my kind of work. Um, I forgot why I said that. Because I don't want your bread art? No, 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 I was, gonna, I was gonna make a point, but I forgot what the point was. Hey, that was the mm -hmm. the no, it was about the plate. Uh, but anyway, so everybody do the lift. Oh, not? Do that yeah. rim. Oh, oh, I know, yeah. I'm over so, just, it said visitor, but I don't trust it. Yeah. This is the part that made me talk to the official just walk. But you know, I, I just, I, oh, a guy in a cart, I, ask. I add this. Across the street. <coughs> <laughs> so it kind of takes a little bit of peak out of it. Out of it. But I mean, everybody that knows about play knows that's peak. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Pete. So much of my work I was working on it then, and then doesn't look like the end result oh, is not really what you see. A mess with the water. And I all and I always finish my work before it's leather hard so I can move it around. And so this thing, this is gonna be the chip and dip hole. So I mean at some point I'm just gonna you know, stick that thing right there. I may not be dead for the And then I you know I will leave all the little jagged edges. I'll just kind of dampen my hand and just yeah. And all those little things, I'll just smooth them out. Yeah. But I do that when it's almost leather hard. Not now, it's Oh, so about clay. I also do not use hard clay. I mean, right. stiff clay. I think Melissa touched on this. I don't, I, when I lived in Georgia, I lived on 100 acres. I made my, I had places to make my own clay. I no longer make my clay. Acres? I lived on 100 acres in the country. So, so I moved to Montana in 93 from Georgia. I, the first time I lived in town, I mean, since 93. My studio is, was a single car garage. So that's 270 square feet. So I have a little studio. So I buy my clay from, there's a place in Tacoma called Clay Art. Fantastic clay. So they make my clay box. So I get it, you know, in the box, 
and y'all don't do that. So, like, yeah, you know, it comes already made pug. Yeah. Um, I wedge it, but I get it sort of like. Yeah, we can compare and contrast the box spread versus. I mean, it's salt. And that way, I wedge it and, you know, make those whole horseshoe things. And I dry it the way I want it. If it's stiff, you kill yourself using a really stiff part of it. I mean, unless you're really hugely strong, which I'm not. I mean, you could use really stiff part of I can't. Morning, Bob. At some point, I'm going to have to cut this thing off. I can't. <laughs> Do you usually put your white slip on when it's this soft, or do you usually wait? That's an excellent question. I'm going to tell you. Okay, good. My clay body has a different red. This is red art. Mm -hmm. My clay body has either Newman, okay. red, or carbon red. Very, very friable red. So when I put on my clay body, when I do that, it whips up the red clay. Right. And kind of scooches those together. Okay. So at... I'm doing this as a one kind of process. My typical process is, <clears throat> let's say, you know, that colored work, <clears throat> throw the pot, my white slip, bone, then they're bone dry, then I put the underglaze. Okay, so, so you throw the pot, you add the white slip, slip, and then let them dry? Typically, for the, let's call it the, um, you know, utilitarian work, mm -hmm. the tableware, I let them get sort of leather hard, then put the white slip on there. Okay. Then when they're bone dry, when they're completely dry, I decorate with the amico in the Okay. Fist fire. Right. And then dump them in my clear glaze. Okay. And do the glaze part. Another of my process is make the pot white slip, fist fire it, my redneck, my Yolica blade, decorate on top, and then fire. So okay. the, two, the act is the same, but the processes are a little different. Right. And what are you decorating with on top of your redneck, my Yolica? Same thing, amico and blade. Okay. And is your Yolica formulated so it's nice and clean and you just dip? Or it goes on by the brush? I never brush anything. No, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I don't, I don't, the, the white blade, the my Yolica, I never brush it. I dip it. Yeah. And um, did, did, did that make sense, Carl? Yeah. Uh, so, oh, so this thing, I, I want to. So the underglazes are used as your overglaze with the mule. That, that yeah. Makes sense. And I typically do not decorate wet, but I'm going to decorate wet here. Mm. You know, when you put the color on dry clay, that absorbs a little bit of the color. I mean, it's a different application. With this, it's gonna sit on the surface, but then you get to kind of scooch it around. Right. I don't want to confuse you all, but let's say that I, this was bone dry and I was decorating. Sometimes I spritz it with water mm -hmm. and then scooch it around the color. So, I mean, I, it's, a, yeah, scooch. it's in my book. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, my idea is to do whatever it takes. There aren't any, I mean, to me, there are there there are no rules about not mean that so flippantly, but there are many rules about making work. It doesn't matter what you do; you get you get to the end result. It doesn't matter how you do it. I mean, given we you want to make work, you have to have some skill about throwing, but you don't have to have a lot. I don't think. 
it, we have to have a lot I'm inventing. But this thing about whipping up the color in it, it's just, I mean, Chris, I'm going to tell you something. Okay. I'm always going to just see you some of my clay, because when you put that white slip on there, I mean, you're going to just be a happy son of a gun. And you'll whip all that red in there. Okay. Yeah. They've been learned. <laughs> no, and, and it's just a suggestion. You know? well, yeah. Pretty good at taking suggestions. Are you really? I think so. <laughs> you have to try anything <laughs> once. Ooh, and, ooh, I'm just gonna I'm getting hairy. I, I'm gonna decorate on top of that, so let's just I'll scooch the color around it. But now what I'm doing a lot is let's say this is a dinner plate. White slip and I make some little marks in there. Mm -hmm. I bisque that. And then I put some laterite or some iron wash or some other kind of clay, just a dirty water, and then put my clear glaze. So there's no color except the clay and the white slip. Mm -hmm. They're not selling well, but I like them. I like them. <laughs> but nobody buys them. <coughs> but I'm trying to say in Spanish. Not, uh, not in Spanish. Not in the sunshine. Oh, not yeah, we need that terrace and we're going down in the shade. So there should be 100 acres of space out there. <laughs> Any questions? Let's take a break. No, <laughs> Somebody should say that. Let's take a break. No one has any questions? Mm -hmm. Bring out the hand. I got a question. Where where is the Great Pyramid of Khufu? It's in southern Okay. Sudan. But where? What? I'm getting to this. Yeah. Jesus. No. Y'all want to know? Or should yeah, I just I not tell you? Y'all want to look it up, and tomorrow you'll have a paper prepared about where it is. Isn't it in Egypt? Egypt? What's your name? Abigail. Abigail? Yeah. Abigail, you win. What's your name, that big thing? It's, it's Egypt. Egypt. How high? What's the height? I do not know the height. And can I ask, why you know, how is it that you know it's in Egypt? I mean, would you study to... I, I was homeschooled, and my mom loves ancient Egypt history, uh -huh. so I learned a lot about oh. ancient Egypt. So, and I just remember things once I learned Egypt. Excellent. When, I've never had a full-time teaching job, but I've done sabbatical replacements. We've both done those kind of things. But no, you've had a real teacher. I've had a real yeah. teacher, though, yeah. So, when I was teaching at the University of Georgia one time, you know, you have to I mean, I've talked there a number of times. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know if y'all, how it is now, but we had to ha actually give a, I'm going to call it a written test. <laughs> so, and I always gave extra credit questions. So one of them was that, where is it, and then how tall. No one, I mean, this was a, you know, these were Jews, sophomores and juniors. No one knew where it was. And then when I said the other question was how high, one person put two miles. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the stratosphere. I mean, even if you don't know. That sounds wrong. So it used to be 480 feet. I don't know, during the war, something was part of it. So now it's 450 feet. Well, that was an interesting one. You should do a, a, a fun fact, a George's House of Play fun fact. Oh, I, have, oh, I, I love trivia. Yeah, fun fact Friday. Ooh, that's a good one. I like that. I'm going to do it. Can you make it go? Uh, I'm going to make a, one of the bowls for those cutout bowls. Okay. So I'm just going to throw the blank. And then that it's kind of a weird process.
process that I've come up with in terms of making these, because you gotta work real wet. Because porcelain is, like I said earlier, those of you that were in here are gonna remember this, those of you that were not, porcelain can be a real jerk. Um, so I have to work with this as wet as possible when I cut it, because it'll rip and tear and crumble if I work dry, even in the slightest. So I'm gonna throw it, let it stiffen up ever so slightly, flip it over, clean up the bottom, flip it back over. It's still gonna have wobble to it, so it's super stressful, and I lose a lot of them in the process. Um, and then I'll show you guys all, like how I measure it all out and cut it all out, and I'll make some templates. I've got, I've got some cardstock, some templates, some sparkly cardstock. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'll show you guys how I make those templates. And there's one of the cutout bowls over there. And then it's also, you know, on the poster, I have a couple in the show, one with handles, one without handles. I'm not gonna do the handles. They're, a, they're not, I mean, they're tricky, but in a workshop environment, they're, they're way too, way too finicky. Are so, you making a plate? No. What are you making? I'm making one of those cutout bowls. Oh, okay. I'm just cutting, I'm making a plank for it. So because porcelain is really finicky, and I know my porcelain is really finicky, I'm really focusing a lot of time and energy on this bottom and compressing all the clay molecules together to make sure that the clay is super happy and that try to prevent cracks from happening. Um, another thing is, is, you know, you guys in here, you guys have all plastic baths. I throw almost exclusively on masonite baths because um, they're a wood product. And what you're gonna do in terms of like anything that needs to be flipped over and trimmed or dealt with in any way, shape, or form is they're gonna start to wick the water away so that that area stiffens up. If I made like a big plate or platter on a, on a plastic bat and like let's say the, the rim is nice and stiff and you can flip it over and, and deal with it, that interior is gonna sag and be super wet. So. Also with these guys, with these bowls, I, I depend on the, the masonite to wick some of that water away because I have to work so extra wet. Um, yeah, so that's, that's that. There is a lot that I do, well not a lot, there are things that I do on the plastic bats, but 90% of the time I use the masonite. Did you say you have plaster bats? Plastic. Oh, plastic. I'm gonna make a plate. <clears throat> I mean, it's a little bit. I was gonna make a dinner plate, so a little too much clay. But and then I'm. I often don't use the bat at all for most things. But for those big things, I have to have a bat. Often I make plates and I just pick them up. Have y'all seen that? Just pick it up and put it on the something. Can I um, mark those? I mean, Louise, those little square pieces of plywood. May I have one of those, please? I mean, oh, sorry. I like that one. The bigger square. One. I, do y'all mind if I tell stories? <coughs> Louise, I love your shoes. Oh, thank you. And, and I have a story. When I was doing this workshop, and I, mean, I, I have some kind of, I trade with somebody that has finished clothes. So I have like nice pants, I have sports coats, they got all that. I was doing this workshop in, I think it was Walla Walla, Washington. And uh, afterwards, they, we had this big meal at somebody's house. And the, the owner of the home, those shoes with the toe cap, I love those. So this guy was a businessman. And he was dressed beautifully, and he had some nice toe cap shoes. I call them lawyer shoes. So I said, boy, those are really beautiful shoes. He said, what size do you wear? I mean, I was dressed like this. He said, what size do you wear? And I said, you know, eight and a half or nine. He said, wait a minute. He goes in his closet of clothes and brings out this pair of shoes. And he said, I never wear these. You can have them. And they were churches. So thanks for me. They're just gorgeous. He gave them to me. I mean, I sent him a pot. But I love that toe cap. Y'all know what I mean? Meet the toe cap shoes? Yeah. Yeah. Is the little metal bit? No. Oh, but just the, the same. Lu Luis. <laughs> Show us your shoes. Yes. <laughs> so, I don't 
I mean, I do, Melissa talked about weighing. I do weigh some things. Most things I don't, but when I, I don't weigh mugs and things like that, but because we all, when we make tableware, we make a lot of different, let's say, bowls. I do have like a, and a lot of it has to do with price. I mean, that I have certain size bowls or a certain size amount. So I do weigh like you know, two and a half or three or for bowls, but I typically don't weigh for anything else. But I, but I know that my plates, this is more than five pounds of plate, but my typical plate is like twice your course. I think it's five pounds with a foot ring, with a trim foot ring. My, my dinner plates are four and a half with a trim foot ring. So I, I, and I have one of those little baby scales, you know what I mean? Like that, you know, the, 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 the way, scale? not a digital. Like the, the, the dial? That thing. Yeah. yeah. All the way just to go. <laughs> no, 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 the one you put, you just put the right on top. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, it goes like that. Like that one yeah. Right yeah. Like that one. Yeah. yeah. So George, we saw you make the salsa bowl. When are, when are you making the chip one? <laughs> oh, so. <laughs> I may just use that, one of those tea bowls. But so it just it gets permanently stuck on there. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I love making this thing. George, I think it's funny that you weigh out your bowls. Those are the things that I don't weigh. Oh really? I weigh everything else, I don't weigh bowls. Well what it started was I was trying to you know, for those of us, all of us who make pots, we kind of figure you know, if you make a mug and it's that big, or you make a mug and it's that big, it's all the same amount of work. Yeah. So they, I mean, it's the same nice. price. Well, no, you do different things. <laughs> but I mean, let's say I make a decorated mug and it's like that four inches. Well, if I make one five inches, it's the same amount of work, in my opinion. So they need to be the same price. I mean, if it's wood fired and then I refire it with my yola, that's a different price. So I started thinking, how can I, this thing about the bowl, so it had to do with, if I make that size bowl, it's 60 bucks. If it's that, it's 80. And I could determine that easily just by, I would weigh one piece and look at it. Then I roll out a coil, and I, so I weigh one, and then I, I eyeball it from there. That's funny, because I, I have, a, I mean, everything in mine is priced based on how much time and decoration goes into it. And then I also, is my respirator charge. Uh-huh. If I had to put my respirator on, it's an extra five bucks right there. <laughs> I don't charge for the gold necessarily, because it's all the gold that's on everything, it's all 23 karat gold. So I don't charge for the gold, but I charge for the respirator being put on my face. How much do you charge for that? Five bucks. <laughs> but it's also like, so there's a five dollar respirator charge, yep. but that's also going to cover my firing, because it is an additional fire. Correct. So at that time and all of that. Uh, so is the how much is that? So mm -hmm. let's say it's a forty dollar mug, and then respirator, the gold part. So is it ten just, plus no, ten? Five bucks. Oh, plus five. Yeah. Okay. I just lump it all. Like I just categorize it as I my respirator. If I have to put my respirator on, it's another five dollars. Well, when I do that, plus like that. I do <laughs> add. <laughs> I add for that also, yeah. but I never thought about. Respirator charge. I call it, yeah. But, I yeah. hate having it. I mean, it's Texas. Right. I, yeah. I don't, like, my, my studio is air conditioned, but I don't it's keep still it terrible. blast. And then, like, if I have stuff like this and the AC is blasting, everything dries funky and it all tacos. Yeah. So I have to be really mindful of that. So half the time I'm sitting there, it's 100 degrees out, I'm sweating, dripping with sweat in my studio working. And then I gotta put like a hot muzzly respirator on. <laughs> it's awful. So yeah, so I got the five dollar respirator charge. And it's great. That's cheap. I think so. <laughs> I mean, I think it's reasonable. I mean, I also buy gold in bulk. If that's a thing, like most people buy like the little little bottles. I buy the big bottles. How much is so, the big bottle? Uh, with shipping. Because this one company is pretty good to me. I end up with uh, $85 for bucks. a 5 gram bottle of 23 yeah. karat gold. And that lasts me a few months. Yeah. <laughs> I got me so much gold. Gold Huh? Gold <laughs> 
does it evaporate any faster using it from the larger bottle? No, because I, I mean, like, if I'm painting it on, then, I mean, I don't have the jar open that long. A lot of the stuff that I do are all, like, the little fine lines that I'm drawing. So it's, I fill my little, like, gold pen cap it and then just work, oh, okay. you know, so I'm working from like two drips at a time. And then when I clean the pen out, I use the essence to clean the pen and then that'll thin out whatever's evaporated off. Um, I know like uh, Frank Hopkins gets his gold from, him and I have had extensive gold conversations. He gets his gold from uh, uh, standard ceramics and, and Pittsburgh and He'll say that, you know, it's not consistently thick or thin, so if it's thin, he has to leave the cap off for a couple days. I don't want those paintings in my studio. Yeah. My dogs and I hang out in my studio. My husband comes and hangs out in my studio. I don't want any of us to, to, to breathe that, you know? Um, so the company that I get it from, it's called Maryland China, and they're great, and it's like always the same thickness, and I mean, I've painted it on large surfaces, and I mean, I've done, I, I won some pots that I made, it's super weird, for Fox Network for the World Cup. They went to Russia, they were on the set for the World Cup in Russia. Strangest commission I've ever had in my life. <laughs> um, but uh, they wanted it, they wanted all these like pretty specific pots and these, these this one grouping of pots, it was like, the top third of the pot was all solid gold. And so two coats, like one coat, fire it, is slightly catchy. Do an entire second coat on there, refire it, perfect. So I don't think that I could have gotten that from like years of working with like Duncan and other other brands of gold. I, I, I would not have made you achieve that. And they, I think Maryland China claims that for any of you gold luster people out there, um, I think that Maryland China claims that their gold is uh, the same recipe as the Hanovia gold, and which is no longer produced. So it's it's good. Absolutely, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> and a lot of times, like yeah, write it down, and a lot of times they'll have. Um, like a 10% off or like a free shipping or, you know, like, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. Here's five bucks on your next order. You know, a lot of times they're like 10% off it. It's like over $150 and I'm like, because they also sell a bunch of like slip cast things for decoration for that world of ceramics. Um, so it's like, I mean, I'm not going to buy, you know, 50 soap dishes that are white glazed soap dishes like that's I just want the gold. <laughs> Give me all the gold.